Good evening. I'm Captain Fred Passman, Commander of the Naval Order of the United States Continental Commandery. I want to welcome you to this March session of our Naval History Virtual Lecture Series. Um, before introducing tonight's guest speaker, uh, one for those who are not Naval Order members, I want to share that the Naval Order's mission is to preserve, promote, celebrate, and enjoy our nation's sea service history and heritage. Um, and this lecture series is an example of that. To learn more about the Naval Order and how you can become involved, visit www.navalorder.org, or you can go to, uh, there's the link rolling below me on the screen. Uh, and from there, you can reach our commandery website um, and learn more about our commandery. The Continental Commandery was formed in 2017 when we realized that we had many Naval Order companions who could not participate in the activities uh, traditionally hosted at physically centered commanderies. And so, uh, as I say, uh, the Continental Commandery hosts uh, the companions who are the dogs and cats that live at substantial distances from physically located commanderies. And if you go to the Naval Order website, you'll be able to um, find our link. Uh, otherwise, you can go to the link that was just screen streamed below the screen. Now, as the lecture progresses this evening, uh, you'll be able to post questions in the comments block. And at the end of um, Mr. Harrington's lecture, we'll have a approximately 15 minute question and answer sessions during which I will pose to him the questions that you've raised during the course of his presentation. Now, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Mr. Peter Harrington. Mr. Harrington is an author, a military historian, an archeologist who curates the Anne S. K. Brown Military Collection in the John Hay Library at Brown University where he has worked for 37 years, he might decide to make this a career. Um, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Peter's authored and edited a number of books, including British Artists and War, The Face of Battle and Paintings uh, and Prints from 1700 to 1914, William Simpson's Afghanistan, Travels of a Special Artist and an Antiquarian during the Second Afghan War, 1878 to 1879, The Castles of Henry VIII, and English Civil War Archaeology. His current research focuses on art and mural programs in the U.S. training camps between 1941 and 1945, remarkably concurrent with World War II. <laughs> um, so welcome, Peter. It's great to have you this evening. Uh, you. We've had a, a number of discussions leading up to this, and, and uh, I'm fascinating by the collection by uh, that, that you're going to share with us this evening. Um, roughly what percentage of the artists that you're going to talk about are professional artists, and how many of them used art as a way to, to grapple with their experience on the ground? I would say all the artists that I'll be profiling tonight were, uh, were trained artists and went on to make careers after the war as professional artists and, and teachers of art. Um, we do have material in the collection by amateurs, just, just men who were just uh, scribbling our way. But most of the art that you'll see tonight was is pretty good. And, and uh, you can see that many of these men and some women uh, had some good training, good art training. And many of them were just fresh out of our school when war was uh, declared. Fascinating. So uh, the folks that you're going to be talking about are folks who were already planning on art as a career, Indeed. as opposed Indeed. to, you know, there's some remarkable avocational artists who generated art during the war. But that's in the collection, not part of this evening's presentation. Right. right. Well, then Correct. I'm going to move to the background and turn the podium over to you and look forward to, to watching and listening to what you've got to teach us this evening. Good. Thank you, Fred.
Well, good afternoon, good evening, uh, should I say, to uh, everybody. Um, as Fred just said, I'm uh, Peter Harrington. I've been curating this collection for a long time. Um, started in 1983, I was actually offered the job by Mrs. Brown, um, who um, uh, died in uh, 1986. Um, she was obsessed with military uniforms. Um, actually, on a honeymoon to Europe in 1930, she acquired some toy soldiers um, because she was just fascinated with the variety of, of the different costumes and so on. Uh, and I, actually, if you visit the John Hay Library at Brown today, you'll be able to see some of these figures. Actually, there's a lot more than she bought. Uh, there's about 5,000 figures on display. Um, but once she got the material back uh, um, to Providence um, after her honeymoon, she started to explore the different types of uh, uniform and so on. And she started to acquire anything that showed uniforms of any nations, uh, any periods, naval, army, uh, you name it. Um, and she started to acquire a lot of material, particularly uh, in the decades after World War II, when very few people were collecting uh, military material. You know, the World War II had put a, a real damper on any interest in, in this sort of material. So she really cornered the market and she had dealers going all over the world, uh, sending material back to Providence on approval. Um, so much so that we've built this massive collection um, that covers really the period 1500 to 1945, with the, the emphasis being on the 18th and 19th century, which, which of course was the heyday for uniforms. But she didn't just buy images of soldiers in uniform, she bought any pictures that had soldiers in them and sailors. So we've got wonderful uh, parade scenes and, and camp scenes, and we've got caricatures. We've got uh, obviously many battle scenes from all periods, uh, all nations. Um, but the interesting thing was when when armies and navies started to um, adopt the same colour uniforms around the, the turn of the uh, 19th, 20th century, she really lost interest. She was more interested in the, the beautiful reds and the blues and the greens and the whites and, and, and so on. Uh, but when everybody started to look the same, she sort of lost interest. Um, so the collection was very strong um, up to about 1918. We had a, a very good World War I section. World War II was, was virtually non-existent. We had uh, folders of, of pictures of, of soldiers in uniform and so on. But in terms of uh, scenes, uh, genre scenes of the period, virtually nothing. And it was uh, purely by chance that this World War II collection uh, developed. But here is the lady herself, uh, 1906, 1985. She's holding one of her porcelain figures. Uh, and on the right, she's uh, flanked by a couple of reenactors. That, that dates from around about the bicentennial. But as I say, um, World War II was really non-existent. So if you had come to the collection um, prior to 1993, uh, there was very little on, uh, on anything after 1918. Um, a uh, few books, a few hit general histories. I think we had the time life history of, of World War II and um, things like that. But really, she was not particularly interested in World War II. Now, I went to a conference in 1993 looking at early digital uh, technology. And this is when, you know, putting 10 images on a Kodak CD-ROM was revolutionary. Um, so I went to this conference uh, to learn about, you know, this revolutionary technology. And over lunch, one day in Philadelphia, I was talking to a lady from the Wisconsin Historical Society. And I was telling her about the military collection and my particular interest, which was how artists had represented war. And she said, oh, you know, you should contact my uncle. Uh, he was an official artist at D-Day. You know, here's, here's his address. And, you know, why don't you give him a call or drop him a line? I'm sure he could help you. Uh, and I thought, well, let's, let's, let's see. So I sent this letter to this gentleman in Woodstock, New York, by the name of Manuel Bromberg. And I said, dear Mr. Bromberg, you know, we're, we're, we'd be very interested if you would consider donating an example of, of your World War II uh, art to us. Um, we would love to, to uh, have some of your art in the collection. And I heard nothing for a couple of weeks. Then, I, then the phone went. This was in the days where you wrote letters and you waited for the letter to you know, come back and so on. And a phone call. Anyway. If, if, this phone call came through and he said, well, uh, I don't have much. 
Uh, because most of it was sent to Washington after the war, because after all, he was an official artist working for the uh, War Department. So all his artwork had to go to Washington afterwards. He said, but um, each artist was given a few little sketches and then drawings and so on to keep for themselves. And let me see what I've got. And I waited another couple of weeks or so, and then this package arrived. Well, I actually, I'm just I've missed this. This is actually uh, how you would look, how you would search the uh, the images in the collection. But anyway, his name was Manuel Bromberg, and he sent me this little package of um, about eleven ink sketches done um, at just after Omaha Beach, just after it was actually D-Day three when he was allowed to land. Um, because he was a, a war artist, uh, they felt it was too dangerous for him to be on the beaches. So he observed the landings at Omaha from the boat, from the ships. Um, his sketches were quite small. Uh, you can actually see on this this one, uh, down the left-hand side, the little perforations. Uh, in fact, we have one of his sketchbooks in the collection, but he did these very quick, um, fascinating little sketches. Here are four more. Um, all, all, well, three of them, two of them uh, on board ship uh, off Omaha Beach. The top left shows, shows a religious service on the right, um, troops waiting to go over. And then uh, when he landed on the beach, of course, um, a lot of the action had moved away. But he was observing the uh, the remains and, and the, the, the victims. Here's a, a picture of uh, four German prisoners evacuating American wounded. And then um, he was, he went through... Uh, France into Germany, um, witnessed the end of the war, and got back to Paris for VE Day. Uh, and this is a quick little sketch. Uh, so these little sketches got me thinking, you know, there must be other artists around. And of course, this was 1993. Um, I thought, well, if, if he's still alive, let's see who else may be alive. So I started to go through contemporary uh, newspapers and magazines of the period. I went through Stars and Stripes. Uh, Life magazine, um, Yank magazine. I started to, we had a few little booklets in the collection, small little booklets of uh, soldier art from World War II. And I would look through, um, looking for illustrations, and I would jot down the name of the artist. And with those names, I would go over to the main library and I'd go to a, a, an annual reference book called Who's Who in American Art. And sure enough, these these artists were, were appearing. Uh, they were still alive. Many of them were in their 70s, 80s. Um, sometimes a little paragraph would say served in the US Army, served in the US Navy, Army, Air Force, and so on. And it gave me an address. So I started to write letters to these uh, artists. Slowly, you know, just a couple of letters a week and then, then maybe five letters a month and so on and so forth. Uh, and I waited and waited, and, and uh, sometimes you know, nothing came. And then a letter came back saying, uh, well, let's see what I've got. And then a package would arrive. And the next artist um, was a gentleman by the name of Albert Brocky Stevenson, who lived in Glen Echo, Maryland. And in late 1993, shortly after Bromberg had sent me his sketches, he sent me a very large package full of, of watercolors and drawings and ink sketches and photographs and documents and so on. It turned out he had been sent over to uh, to England to cover the preparations for the invasion. Um, so he was sketching. He obviously had official permission and he had this pass, which we actually have, uh, because you know he could be suspected of being a German spy. He had to flash his pass everywhere he went. But he was down in the southwest, in, in Devon and Cornwall, in Torbay and Plymouth and Portsmouth and so on, sketching the preparations. We've got wonderful scenes of, of convoys along little country lanes and, and uh, landing craft preparations and so on. And uh, literally, he sent me everything he had, he'd, uh, he'd done. Uh, some of it ended up with the U.S. Army, but for some reason, he was able to keep a lot. And um, I think he was looking for a, a home for it. And my letter arrived and he thought, here we go. So we've got this great collection uh, by Brocky Stevenson that actually the top right shows uh, American ships in Torbay Harbor, which is down Torquay, uh, Devon Way. Um, in sort of the weeks leading up to D-Day, um, bottom left is a convoy scene. And bottom right, uh, a scene near, again, down in, in Devon with um, American MPs. Uh, guarding, you'll see the barrage balloons. Uh, wonderful um, uh, artwork uh, captures the immediacy of the moment. 
uh, top left, he's uh, he's sketching. Uh, before he was shipped to Europe, he was at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and he was fascinated with with big vehicles and big tanks, and he was always sketching um, half tracks and, and tanks and, and armored cars. He just loved that, and we've got lots of pictures of of those things. Uh, the next scene uh, actually captures um, uh, HMS Rodney um, in uh, in uh, actually it's. it's uh, Portland Harbour, Devon, Dorset, should I say? Um, and you actually see the da dazzled camouflage on the uh, the the hull, uh, flanked by some American ships. Uh, the Rodney had been bombarding the um, the French coast, and it just re returned, and he sketched it. And then uh, I thought I'd put that up because um, it has a nice nautical flavour. Another artist, and this happened. A lot of these these uh, artists really emerged fortuitously. Um, obviously, in 1990, between 1991 and 1995, there was a lot of commemorations of the 50th anniversary of World War II. There was lots of uh, books coming out, magazine articles. And American Heritage, um, they were inundated with articles uh, sent in by authors covering all aspects of World War II. But it turned out the editor of American Heritage was a gentleman by the name of Colin Murphy. And he submitted an article which was published about his father, John Cullen Murphy, who was actually attached to MacArthur's staff, uh, was with MacArthur in the Philippines, um, went with him to, into uh, to Japan, in, into Tokyo, uh, observed the surrender, uh, was with him in Tokyo, uh, sketched. We have portraits of MacArthur's wife and son. We have the room where um, he met Japanese officials. We have returning Japanese POWs, all sorts of scenes. In fact, this bottom right-hand picture uh, is a is a, a little watercolor of a couple of uh, African-American GIs dancing with Japanese geishas. Um, and the, the picture to the bottom left uh, is Women's Army Corps in New Guinea, which is sketched. We've got some wonderful, uh, wonderful watercolors of, of these. Uh, top left and top right were, were sketched on board ship. Um, you see a sailor on the left-hand side. Um, now, John Cullen Murphy's name may be familiar because he was the creator of the Prince Valiant cartoon strip. Um, spent many years as, as a cartoonist, uh, lived in Coscob, Connecticut, uh, where he passed away. So, of course, I saw the article in American Heritage, and immediately I contacted uh, the magazine, um, Colin Murphy and I said, "Oh, you know, we would be honoured because Colin talked about growing up in the house in Coscop, seeing all these pictures on the walls that his father did." So I, I asked Colin. I said, "You know, would you be interested in, in donating uh, an example?" Well, sure enough, he sent me oh, probably close to a hundred watercolors and sketches and drawings and some sketchbooks. And the sketchbooks still reeked of cigarette smoke. Obviously, you know that. We still had that aroma from World War II, full of fascinating little sketches. Um, so that was a, a real uh, addition. So literally within four or five months, we've gone we've gone from 11 little ink sketches to now uh, over 120, 130 images. And I began to think, okay, well, 1994 is the uh, the 50th anniversary of, of D-Day. You know, maybe I could put some a little exhibition together using... Bromberg's sketches and uh, Stevenson's sketches and so on. Uh, so sure enough, I, I did a, a little exhibition um, at Brown in 1994 on, on D-Day. Uh, and then it was also, I think, shown at uh, Cape Cod. Uh, but it was it was all sort of just developing uh, purely from that serendipitous meeting with Bromberg's uh, niece. Another artist um, actually invited me down to, to his house in Westchester, Pennsylvania, Richard Baldwin. So I drove down there, uh, spring of 1994, and he took me into his studio. And there were all these wonderful watercolors and sketches and drawings. And he said, what do you want? Just take what you want. And of course, I thought I was like a kid in a candy store. I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, what do I do when somebody gives me that opportunity? So I took a a good amount, but I left him with a lot. Richard um, was a, a photographer with the 20th Air Force. Um, he spent most of his most of his war years. Uh, he landed on Iwo Jima 
after the island had been secured. And uh, he sketched uh, all the, the, the planes landing and taking off. He sketched uh, scenes of the, the destruction. Uh, he sketched a few scenes of the battle, basically from um, first-hand accounts, because I say he, he didn't land until till, uh, the island had been secured. The actual picture on the bottom left was when he was training at Camp Pendleton uh, in California. Shows some airmen being uh, taught um, methodology and so on. But it really is a wonderful, uh, wonderful collection. And, and the top picture, as you see, is a, a ruined uh, landing craft on the um, the black volcanic sand of, of Iwo Jima. So it was, a, it was a wonderful, and actually had this very large uh, painting on Masonite showing Marines attacking Suribachi. Uh, again, based on, on uh, accounts that he had picked up. And he said, do you want that? It was a massive thing. So I said, well, I'll take that. It was framed. So I put it in the car, which, you know, probably wasn't the best thing to do because, uh, you know, I, the, it wasn't insured if, if I had been in a crash or something. But anyway, made it back to Brown safely and it's now hanging in the, the gallery. It's a, a really fine scene with Marines in the foreground and Suribachi in the background. So uh, now the collection was, was approaching 200 images. And I was also thinking, okay, if we did a D-Day exhibition in 1994, 1995 would be the 50th anniversary of the Pacific War uh, in, in Iwo Jima, Okinawa. Maybe I could do something on, on that. So um, well, let's see what comes in next. Um, contacted a few artists who never made it to the uh, the front lines. Um, actually, I, I, I should correct myself. Jack, Jack Coggins did eventually join up, but... In 1941-42, he was an artist in New York for Life magazine. And uh, these sketches, these wonderful wash drawings, were done for Life magazine. Uh, the, the top left is a scene from uh, Pearl Harbor. And that, that appeared, I think, um, January, I think it was late January 1942, showing uh, water tenders um, dousing uh, flames on, a, on a, a U.S. destroyer. And the bottom right is the British attack on, on uh, Cape Matapan um, during the Italian campaign of 1941 with a, uh, I think it's a swordfish, uh, just drops his torpedo and the torpedo's heading to this Italian battleship. These are really large uh, wash drawings, very well done, uh, which were published. So it was, it was nice to get uh, some of, sort of illustrations uh, done for magazines. Now, Coggins, as I mentioned, did eventually join up, and he was uh, taken on by Yank magazine, which, um, as you know, or, or some of you may know, that was the U.S. Army's uh, magazine. It started in, in uh, 42 and went up to 45. It was published, eventually published in 19 editions all, all around the world, everywhere uh, U.S. forces were, uh, they published editions. So he was taken on uh, as an artist um, by Yank. But what, another artist who actually... Uh, gave us material from Yank was a gentleman by the name of Robert Greenhall who lived in New City, New York and he also invited me to visit him so I went to his house uh, again in 1994 I think um, took me into his studio had all these wonderful little ink sketches as I say he was commissioned by Yank uh, he went to the Pacific he was on Guam um, and some of the other islands some of the atolls um, and actually, the scene to the right, um, I put up because I, I knew I was talking to, some, to a naval uh, aficionados. But this is uh, taken on board USS Bella Wood, one of the aircraft carriers, um, at an attack on Wake Island uh, early in the war. I think it was 1942 or 43. Um, quick sketch, uh, which you would then uh, mail off um, to eventually to New York. New York was the, the main office uh, for the early editions of Yank. And these were published. So uh, we were able to identify when and where they were published and get the captions. But he was very good. You can see there's, there's a lot of writing on the top left. Uh, and on the back of them, uh, lots of captions. And obviously, uh, the official census mark, um, you know, telling us, it, you know, this has been cleared for, for uh, publication. So we've got um, well, probably about 30 of his sketches. In fact, I just wrote an article uh, on Greenhall in the uh, latest edition of uh, Military History Quarterly. So if you're interested, there's a short little article about him and his artwork and how he um, uh, managed to, to sketch 
under fire because in so, some cases he was uh, in, a, in a combat zone uh, on shore. Now we've also got, you will be familiar with the term, the ghost army. Uh, you, some of you may have seen the PBS documentary that was shown, it's getting on uh, 10 years ago now, I think. Uh, the Ghost Army were the uh, 6th or 3rd Camouflage Battalion. Uh, they were tasked with, with deception, um, deceiving the, the Germans into thinking, or initially, that the invasion was going to come from the Pas de Calais as opposed to uh, southwest England. So, you know, they built these uh, dummy tanks. Uh, they painted silhouettes on airfields. And so there's that wonderful um, uh, footage of, of uh, you see this, this Sherman tank sitting in a field. And then these four uh, soldiers walk up, um, pick it up and carry it away. Um, well, these were the, some of the artists, uh, Morton, Jarvey, Contreras, Tompkins, and there's some others. And um, actually, the director, the, 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 um, the person who put together that PBS documentary, Rick Bayer, uh, was able to um, direct some of the artwork to us. Uh, the artists had passed away, but their families uh, were still alive. And, and um, so, in fact, just... Back in January, we got uh, about a dozen watercolours by um, the family of Arthur Singer. But uh, Richard Morton on the top left, I actually contacted him a long time before the um, uh, the uh, Ghost Army documentary came along. And he has wonderful little sketches of these French civilians, you know, Viva l'Amérique and so on. Um, they were very skilled artists. Uh, none of the artwork shows any of the... Um, the work that they were doing that was obviously top secret but they were sketching the, the destruction the landscapes the tedium of war um we've got lots and lots of pictures of of soldiers just sleeping and eating and writing letters and, and just uh just the the, the 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 background to to combat um but there was also room for humor um these are these were well there's richard morden again with this great sketch of uh, Hitler and Mussolini uh, literally milking France. Uh, and there's France sort of giving them this sort of look as though, you know, you've had enough now, go away. Um, and then these, these two sketches by Walter Arnett, uh, one of the Ghost Army uh, artists. And he was actually encouraged by his commanding officer to, to do these humorous sketches just to basically boost morale. And they really are very funny. Uh, you, Probably can't really read the sketch, the uh, captions on this small screen, but uh, uh, if you go onto the uh, the website, um, the digital archive, you can blow them up and, and see the, the the really very funny uh, comments that that they're making. So those are the Ghost Army artists. Now you're probably thinking, well, uh, you know, we're part of the naval commandery. Um, how is it we're not seeing any uh, artwork by naval artists? I did try. I did sincerely try. I contacted uh, some of the artists. Um, some of you may know that uh, the U.S. Navy were the, actually first, the first uh, U.S. armed forces uh, to employ artists in World War II. They commissioned six artists in 1942 uh, to go on board ship and record uh, the war in, in 1942. Some of the names may be familiar to you. Um, uh, Mitchell Jameson, uh, Dwight Schepler, uh, Griffith Bailey Cole, um, Alexander Russo, uh, Albert Murray. There were six of them all together. I wrote to Albert Murray, unfortunately, two years after his death and uh, was put in touch with the Albert Murray Trust. And they said, well, we're keeping all the artwork and the rest is with the US Navy. Um, I wrote to Alexander Russo and he said, well, all his work is again with the Navy, he had nothing to um, to give us, but if we actually acquired one watercolor uh, at an auction, which we'll see in a moment. Well, William Bostick, uh, fascinating. He wasn't an official um, artist. He was a cartographer for the U.S. Navy, and he was tasked with the uh, with creating the charts for the invasion of Sicily and for the D-Day operations. And in fact, the the uh, the chart to the bottom right was one of his uh, one of his uh, works. Uh, this is based on um, uh, aerial, photog aerial photography, um, some ship, you know, some views, um, submarines, um, sort of took photographs and, and so on before the, uh, the invasion. Um, so they put together these maps. Um, you'll see uh, red, 
red beach and, and green, dog green, and so on and so forth. If you really zoom in, there's a lot of information on there, uh, including Vervel Sauvaire, which you'll see in a moment. Um, but when he wasn't doing these these charts, uh, he was creating some incredible watercolors. Uh, again, he was down in the in the southwest of England. Uh, obviously, if he's working on the the um, Omaha Beach and Utah Beach charts, um, he had to be as close as possible to the, the places. Um, and he did these very large watercolors of preparations. This is an LCI, I think it's a landing craft infantry uh, at Weymouth. Which is one of the staging points for um I think for Utah or maybe in Omaha, I forget which, which one. Um fascinating watercolors. Um again, I was able to speak to many of these artists that they've, they've all passed now. Um, but the, in 1993, 94, 95, they were still very much with us. And they besides sending me watercolors, they sent me uh, photographs, newspaper clippings, uh, exhibition catalogues accounts of their life. Uh, here's another one by Bostick showing an um, uh, LST heading out from probably maybe Dartmouth Harbour in, in Devon, probably on a, a practice exercise. Um, I don't think it's uh, the 6th of, uh, 5th of June, actually, when they would have left, um, but but I'm not sure. Uh, great scenes. Here's another one of, a, of a repair work being done on a, a landing craft. Um, so we were really pleased to get Bostick's work. Um, we do have these two, we have copies of these two pictures. We don't own them. I think they, they're down in the uh, US Navy R, Navy R collection. Uh, but I put them up because the one on the left showing the, the landing craft going in on Omaha, you'll see the two commanders uh, aside of one of the charts, uh, the chart that we just saw, um, Bostick included uh, it in, in this, this drawing. And he also, um, when he landed on Omaha, he saw. Uh, the price of war, up close and personal. Uh, these are American uh, fatalities uh, waiting for burial. So as I say, these are just copies which he sent us, um, but the originals are down in, in um, uh, Washington, D.C. Now, Alexander Russo, I did mention that I, I wrote to him. He was very kind in his reply, but he said, you know, unfortunately, everything went to Washington. And as I said, uh, talking about Bromberg, you know, the official artists, uh, they were, they were, their role was to create artwork for the nation, um, so it was understandable that they would go down to the to the uh, to Washington D.C. to the Army and Navy and the, the Army Air Force and so on. But uh, several years ago, this came up on the on the uh, market, and we were approached because the the dealer, I think actually it was a dealer in, in um, Boston, knew that we had a World War II art collection. And said, "Well, we used it, so we we acquired it because you know, I wanted a, a work by Alexander Russo." Uh, he landed on D-Day. I think D-Day plus four. Um, and this is actually in Verville somewhere. Now you'll remember the, the chart that Bostick created. Um, and there was, you can see Verville somewhere. Well, he's he's gone there and he's observing uh, American GIs just sort of walking around and see some of the destruction and so on. Uh, so we're, we're pleased to get that. And Dwight Shepler, uh, again, we acquired this from a, a dealer. Um, all his work is down in in, uh, in Washington D.C. and he did some tremendous work, particularly for the uh, the D-Day landings and the preparations, uh, including the uh, the attacks on uh, Slats and Sands where the, they were practicing the landings. Um, in fact, I I gave a talk on on um, preparations for D-Day on a um, a Viking cruise some years ago, and I, I borrowed some of his. Uh, sketch uh, scans of some of his sketches for that talk from the uh, the naval art collection. But we've got this great portrait uh, of an unknown officer. It's not Dwight Shepler, but it's an unknown officer. It's it's uh, it's a pastel portrait. So I was really pleased. Uh, we've got at least two of the official artists represented in the um, in the collection. But we were much luckier with the the Marine Corps. Um, now the Marine Corps they had a, an official art program, but it wasn't very well established um there was really sort of no mechanism for the artists to really for the for the marine corps to really gather the work uh, the artists were sent out um some of the work was sent back to guam and in hawaii uh, for pr work but a lot of it remained with the the artists themselves and uh, we'll come to one in a moment but um theo heos uh, was a combat photographer he was a trained artist but uh, 
He was he joined the Marines in 1942, and um, his task was to to uh, to record uh, combat on these Pacific islands. Uh, initially, uh, the Marshall Islands, and then was Saipan and Tinian, and ended up on Iwo Jima. Uh, got a Bronze Star, wounded. Um, and I was able to visit him and his wife in his studio in uh, Lower Manhattan uh, about 1995. And his, his studio was crammed full of, of artwork, not, not all World War II by any means. He had a couple of drawfuls, which he pulled open, and, and I started salivating seeing all this, this World War II artwork. But he did donate some some uh, nice artwork. This is actually Pearl Harbor after the, this is, uh, this is taken in, I think, 45. Of 44 before he went to uh, he came back before he went to Iwo Jima. So th this is 1944. There's the Oklahoma in the uh, left foreground, I think. And a couple of other pictures. Uh, one an explosion which he witnessed on Saipan, uh, and then the oil painting in the top left is a, a scene from Iwo Jima. Now Harry Reeks, this uh, fascinating fascinating man. Um, I mentioned that you know in 1994, 95, um, people were sending articles to uh, American magazines, American Heritage, American History. You know, would you be interested in publishing this? Um, and after we had contacted American Heritage, they 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 started to contact, get back to me saying, you know, I know you said if if we ever heard about any artwork, well, we were sent this article uh, about this this uh, Marine Corps artist, and uh, we can, we don't have enough space. We're inundated, but. Um, here's the information about him. So I wrote to the the artist's uh, mother, uh, sorry, daughter. He had passed away in 1982. Uh, lived in the Gulf Coast, Mississippi. It turned out he had some like uh, she had like 140 sketches on watercolors and drawings, mostly done on Iwo Jima. And uh, she came up to Providence um, with um, uh, Harry Reeks's widow. And they delivered quite a large amount. Um, and then she sent me more. So much so that we were able to do uh, an Iwo Jima 50th anniversary exhibition in um, in 1995. And uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful scene showing a, a landing craft leaving a, an LST on its way into uh, Iwo Jima. In fact, you, I think that may be um, Suribachi in, in the right background. But really vivid. Um, Fantastic uh, pieces of work, um, but he also uh, captured the horrors of the war. In fact, a lot of his work was rejected by Marine Corps public relations because it was too graphic, too vivid. It just was not suitable for promoting or recruiting um, people into the into the Corps. Uh, this is one of the airfields on Iwo Jima. Uh, this is a, a young Marine with a thousand yards there. We've got several sketches like this. Uh, a man has been on, on the on the island for twenty odd days. Uh, he spent about twenty days. Uh, Rick spent about twenty days on the island. He dug in, dug out a, a little studio for himself. He would go up to the front lines, make quick sketches, then re, uh, retreat to the beach and uh, do these little watercolors. And they I say they were sent off to Guam and and um, Hawaii, but eventually they all came back to him, and and we have them now. And here's one from Bougainville before he. He was on Iwo Jima. Uh, this is a dugout. Fasc fascinating, and I've written about him as well in a, in a previous issue of MHQ. A couple of other Marine Corps artists, um, official in a sense that they were they were work, doing work for the Marine Corps, but um, uh, they didn't do much combat work. Although Vic Donahue did. Uh, we only have uh, one or two pictures by him. Doug Moore was most of his the artwork we have by him was done at uh, Paris Island. And in fact, the, the scene on the left shows uh, new recruits um, you know, learning um, how to put together a rifle. And Richard Gibney, who was a, a, an official artist on Saipan, these are a couple of etchings. He was uh, lived in Massachusetts. Um, on the on left is, is just about to throw a grenade, and on the right is a, a track through the jungles of Saipan. Um, Marine Corps Museum down in Quantico has a great collection of, of oil paintings, watercolors, wash drawings by Gibney, but we were fortunate to get these these two. Now, as I wind up this talk, I just want to finish with a, a couple of lady artists. Um, and we do have uh, two, two lady artists in the collection, uh, both of which I was able to visit. Uh, Mimi Karash Lesser was not in the armed forces, but she 
with the USO. She was with the USO shows. Uh, she was sent to um, uh, um, Germany after the, the uh, surrender. And uh, her task was to visit um, hospitals where um, wounded American servicemen were um, and to do their portraits so they could send the portraits home to loved ones and so on. This was quite a common thing in uh, towards the end of the war. In fact, I just finished reading a book about um, uh, an artist who um, regularly visited um, a naval hospital, I think in New Jersey or New York, um, sketching wounded uh, sailors and soldiers um, and giving them the portraits. But when she wasn't doing portraits, she was recording the the, um, the aftermath of the, the devastation of the war. Uh, we've got this picture of a, an SS barracks on the top left with a, a portrait of Hitler, which obviously some somebody's fired a machine gun at. Um, the top right, where I don't know how you would find your way around this sign showing every direction, every division, every unit and so on. And then the Bucket Brigade in Stuttgart, um, German civilians uh, clearing away the rubble. Um, she lived in Mamaroneck, New York, and, and she, she gave us some wonderful artwork. So it was really uh, great to get a, a woman's perspective uh, from, of, of the war and also uh, not so much the combat, but the aftermath of war. Uh, and the second lady artist was Anne Poor, whose father was Henry Varnum Poor. He was a significant artist in the 1930s, 40s. He was doing murals for the WPA program. Uh, actually, was was the um, uh, on the the War Department's Art Advisory Committee for the uh, Army Art Program in 1943. But his daughter was in the Women's Army Corps and ended up in the Philippines. Uh, and I was able to visit her on the same day I visited Robert Greenhouse because she also lived in New City, New York. Uh, at that time, she was quite feeble, but she was able to uh, give me photographs and this lovely watercolor of, of um, loaded, loading wounded onto a, a transport plane uh, in Manila. So uh, again, it was just really great to to um, to get those those two ladies' perspectives. Now the collection is still growing. Uh, only last year. Uh, actually, a Rhode Island family uh, contacted us. I'd, back oh, about 20 years ago, the Providence Journal ran an article about this uh, artist in, in, who lived in uh, Rhode Island who had been in the Pacific with um, uh, an aviation engineer battalion, which was uh, composed of African-Americans, although uh, the officers were all white and he was a white lieutenant. Um, and I wrote at the time saying we would love to have anything. Anyway, they contacted me about 20 years later saying, would you be interested? That's the sons of the, the artist. Uh, and sure enough, the, the, the artwork was delivered to us last year. And it's wonderful, wonderful pictures of African-American troops. This, this um, scenes um, out in the Pacific repairing planes and so on. Uh, the right-hand scene is actually a, uh, a surgical operation. Um, so I'd say the collection is still growing. Um, we got the Ghost Army sketches from Arthur Singer's family uh, recently. Um, but you'll know, you'll remember that we started off this talk by uh, by talking about Manuel Bromberg, who started all this off um, in 1993. Um, and I have to finish on a somewhat sad note because um, Manny passed away last month and he was um, about four weeks shy of his 105th birthday. Uh, it's quite amazing because all the other artists have, have long gone um, but he made it to 104. I saw him actually in this picture uh, a few years ago, and he was still very sharp. And I was asking him questions because I'd missed him a few times. He said, I've told you all this before. You've asked these questions before, but I just want to refresh my mind. Anyway, he passed away uh, in March in Woodstock, New York. His daughter let me know. And uh, I'll be going there sometime in the spring because um, there's more artwork, which he promised us. Um, so I'll be picking that up and adding it to the collection. So that is my talk. Um, I hope I've given you a taste of, of this incredible collection, which, as I say, was not planned at the outset. It just purely by chance, a, a chance meeting at a, at a conference. Uh, had I not met that lady, uh, none of this would have happened. Uh, we've done a remarkable a lot of work with it. We've, we've digitized of the World War II collection. We've digitized over 1,500 uh, sketches, drawings, paintings, watercolors. Uh, there's still more things to, to digitize. We've done exhibitions, um, even as far as where Slovakia, 
the US Embassy in Bratislava contacted me because they knew about our collection about eight years ago and said, we would like to do an art exhibition uh, on World War II. And I said, OK, we've got lots of uh, European artwork. And said, oh, no, we're not interested in, in the war in Europe. Our people know all about this. No, we want, to, we want no war in the Pacific. So I sent a ship out about 30 watercolors of, of Okinawa, Saipan, Tinian, uh, Iwo Jima, Philippines to these technical schools in, um, in Slovakia uh, where students um, viewed this exhibition. I've got some, some photographs of them looking at these pictures of the Pacific War because they felt that the uh, students didn't know enough about the Pacific War. They knew plenty about the war in Europe. Um, We've done magazine articles. We've done. We've contributed to books. Uh, the documentary "They Drew Fire" uh, used our collection. The Ghost Army used our collection. So it's been a very, been very exciting uh, program. So I'll end there. I'll uh, put my email address up for you in case any of you want to um, ask me a question. I may have uh, mentioned something that's um, you know you wanted to really uh, go into some detail. You may even know somebody who has some artwork who wants to find a good home for it but uh, i'll call it a day there and i'll be happy to answer any questions thank you peter that was that was really a wonderful presentation uh, quite different from what we've seen before and uh, one of the questions that came to my mind was a matter of process so as you mentioned most of these fellows and gals were not in the um, thick of things, and I'm going to just quiet that part of the screen. Yeah, okay. Um, whoops. Sorry. Try, there we go. Um, uh, so did they normally start with pencil, ink, or charcoal? And then when they were uh, had a little bit more time on their hands, then convert those original sketches into watercolors. It sounds like it was a fairly short timeline between yes. observing, sketching, finalizing, and sending back to the states for publication. Yeah, that's that's very true. I mean, uh, at the front line, in fact, all the official, uh, the uh, official artists with the U.S. Army were all issued a camera. Um, and they used the cameras to great extent to to, uh, to capture a scene, and then they would turn that scene into a vibrant uh, image. Um, as you say, many most most of the work was either photography or quick sketches. Um, many of the artists, in fact, we've got one diary of a, an artist who was um, uh, observing landings on Pacific islands and, and was getting frustrated because the army were not allowing him to land. And he said, "You know, how can we? How can we?" Draw a landing, you know, um, several hundred uh, feet away from the from the uh, the beach. Uh, so there was quite quite a lot of frustration among the artists, um, and also the, the 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 artists who were not official had a, a, lot, a hard time getting materials. Uh, we've got sketches done on the back of V mail. Uh, one artist in the China Burma India campaign, all his sketches are on uh, backs of uh, cardboard boxes. Um, so it really is a hodgepodge, and it's, it's, it's a nightmare for, for conservators to, to, to preserve this stuff. But yes, the, uh, the official artists made sketches and then did a, a finished piece um, back in the safety of a, of a, a house or um, somewhere, and then it was mailed off. And the, the idea was, you know, back in, uh, in 1945, the, um, the War Department had this idea of creating a, a, a national war museum. Uh, and all his artwork was destined for that. Well, it never happened. Uh, and even in the 19, late 50s, Mrs. Brown's husband was on a committee looking at suitable places around Washington, D.C. to create a National War Museum, but they could not settle on a, on a site and so on. Uh, and, of course, it's only been in the last uh, three years that the uh, Museum of the American Soldier was, was opened at Fort Belvoir, and I hear that there's got to be um, uh, a National Naval Museum uh, coming down the pipeline. Well, we, we do have a Naval History Museum, but we're right. also the Na Naval History Command is is still, I guess, negotiating property mm -hmm. for a new Naval History Museum that's outside the gate, as opposed to right now. You know, you have to be able to get onto the base and right. in order to get into the museum. Right. So right. Uh, it's it's tough for civilian visitors to see the the, the museum. 
yeah. another question that's come in uh William Bostick's uh, cartography is very interesting is his work available to view on the Brown University library portal or is that also property of the Navy no no everything that you've seen tonight uh is is available on the the digital archive um I did uh, I think the second or third shot that, that I I showed off which was the uh the um, front page of the digital archive, uh, which you can get to if you go to the Brown University Library uh, homepage and search NSK Brown Military Collection. Um, there are over 28,000 images in that uh, in that archive, and that covers uh, soldiers, soldiering, naval, na uh, naval warfare history from 1500 to 1945. So all the the Bostic watercolors that we own have been digitized the map hasn't because that was a that was a, a modern color photocopy we do not have uh copyright on that map uh, and the two little sketches which we only have copies of we don't have copyright so they're not a digital like that but all the watercolors are i see one question were the artists uh, fully trained for combat were any wounded or killed uh two artists were killed one was um we don't have any artwork by him, but he was killed in a plane crash um, over Burma. Um, I forget, I forget where the other one was uh, was killed. Uh, every artist was was trained. They had to go through boot camp, uh, Marines, um, Army, and I assume the Navy artists. They all had to do training. They were trained in in uh, in uh, use of rifles and so on. Um, several were wounded. Uh, in fact, I think Reeks Reeks was wounded in the hand um he has a great story he was uh one day on iwo jima or bougainville he actually had a, a japanese soldier in his sight in his gun sights for several minutes but he didn't fire the gun and he said you know that's not my role my role is an artist I, i'm not here to to kill so he never killed anybody theo heos was was wounded got a bronze star uh but for, for, for his combat photography uh he was commended for his his excellent uh, photographs done under fire uh, so they, they all had a they all had a story. One artist I didn't profile was uh, was shot down over Italy uh, in a, a U.S. bomber. Um, it was landed um, actually no, it was, uh, landed in um, parachuted out over Nuremberg, and was all, almost killed by German uh, civilians, but was protected by German soldiers. Was sent to a stalag um, and did incredible sketches. Um, and you think, well, how did he get out of materials in in a POW camp. Well, he um, he would draw sexy women, uh, which he would give to the the German uh, soldiers uh, in return for paper. Um, so he did sexy women for the German soldiers, and then he would sketch the the camp and the guard towers and the barracks. And he came down from Lincoln, Rhode Island, so it was only a, a thirty minute drive uh, back in about nineteen ninety five, and gave us all his watercolors. So we've got these these great prison camp pictures. Uh, we've got two oil paintings that were done by um, uh, another POW in Japan uh, who was beaten and tortured um, in um, in the Pacific. Um, all his sketches were, were destroyed. Um, and then later on, uh, when he was back in, uh, in Stateside, um, he created um, paintings from memory. So we have two paintings, which are quite, quite gruesome. They're showing a couple of very emaciated american soldiers burying uh, another prisoner watched by japanese soldiers um so again they, they were painted from memory because all his artwork was was destroyed um you know if you imagine uh, doing artwork in the pacific theater especially with the humidity and the dampness and so on a lot of the a lot of the sketches and the sketchbooks just didn't didn't make it back to the states right so speaking of that and again coming back to process I saw most of the work was either looked like ink or charcoal or watercolor. Was that because that was the easiest to wrap up and ship? I mean, because I think you showed us one oil painting in yeah. the entire coll collection. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I think the oil paintings the, were done uh, after the fact. Um, watercolors, you know, you just have your little palettes, a little box of, of, of little watercolor um, palettes and so on. It's very easy equipment to carry around. Oil painting, you know, it's it's you're not going to be carrying around canvases. Uh, oil painting takes time to oil paint takes time to mix and then to dry. You know, you can't tell the Japanese and Germans. Could you just wait a couple of hours? I'm just letting my paintings just drying. 
Um, so yes, yeah, sketches uh, with with pencil and and ink and so on. Charcoal, not so much charcoal, smudges a lot, and, and uh, but pen and ink um, and pencil. They, those were the mediums of choice. So we have a military uniform question. Uh, yeah. Are you a, a person that can discuss the intersection of camouflage of, of uniforms and ships? Uh, it's interesting you should really say that. Um, the Rhode Island School of Design, which is just down the hill from Brown University, um, has a very good collection of dazzle camouflage from World War I. Uh, Providence um, had a shipbuilding industry. Uh, and they were building uh, merchant ships during in 1916, 1917, or 1917, 1918. And uh, the war departments uh, sent uh, shipyards um, guides to doing dazzle camouflage. Um, and some gentleman years ago gave RISD uh, this collection. They're wonderful. Each there's a separate page, and they're sort of um, they're ships with all these different designs, basically as a guide to to dazzle camouflage. So years ago, the, the curator down at the School of Design um, had a, a one-day seminar on camouflage, basically to profile uh, this dazzle camouflage. But she asked me, did, did I know anything about any, uh, camouflage? So I was I gave her an overview of camouflage, but mostly from the uh, from you know, ancient Greece, uh, Romans, um, uh, British in, in um, South Africa, in wearing red uniforms and, and not being very successful. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, so I brought, I sort of gave the, the background and then she talked about the dazzle camouflage. In fact, I think she's working on a book on it. And then we've done a couple of uh, seminars for the Naval War College. Um, I forget which professor it is, but he brings his class up. Uh, they, they spend an hour at Brown and then they walk down the hill to uh, school design. Uh, and I give them my little spiel on uh, general history of camouflage and then they go to the school design and they, they get to see the the dazzle camouflage so uh, we have a bit of history there but i don't know i, I yes I, I i can i can give you my little talk on on the camouflage but it's it's, it's 20 uh, it's, seconds or less yeah yeah so you mentioned I mean, the red coats it calls to mind an old uh, story by a uh, fallen from grace comedian one of his early routines about you know toss of the coin and the uh, the Americans get to uh, wear um, doe skins and hide in the woods, and the British much march in straight lines, wear yep. red coats, yep. and, and only fire synchronously. I know. Um, I mean, I, I I've done work on on the British in in uh, Egypt and Sudan and so on, and you think, my goodness, red against sand. I mean, just the, they didn't learn from the revolution. They they didn't learn from the Napoleonic Wars. They didn't learn from the Crimean War. I mean, they were still wearing red. Well, uh, we, right we have our um, recently retired blueberry uniforms that the only thing they would camouflage a sailor uh, as a profile against haze gray, they made excellent targets. But if yep. they happened to fall overboard, you would never see them. Um, yep. you, you know, who, who thought that one up? One can only yep. scratch one's head. We've got uh, a collection. Uh, so at yeah. the hour. This has been a fascinating conversation. Again, I want to thank you for you know a very illuminating uh, and enlightening uh, presentation. Great stuff. Um, uh, maybe we can get you back uh, next year to talk, talk about, about your <laughs> pieces of you know uh, work and and you know full screen for a given uh, item uh, yeah. to, to go into more deep detail on fewer objects. Maybe between now and then I'll, I'll come visit. Um, yeah, hopefully to. you're not retiring that soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, as we uh, wrap up, I just want to let everybody know that on April 18th, our next Naval History Lecture will be, uh, again, this is um, anniversary of the Battle of Midway, um, 80th anniversary, and uh, we look forward to learning about the Battle of Midway, uh, some insights that those of us even who think we know about the battle uh, through the last several lectures, like the Battle of Coral Sea in uh, December, um, we, we don't necessarily know as much as we thought we did. And then also two days later, uh, April 20th, we'll be having our commanderies uh, business meeting. And I wanna invite all companions to join us for that business meeting. Um, the key item of conversation is where do we want to go with our Naval History lecture and 
what can we do to participate? There are a number of uh, Naval Weeks coming up um, where around the country where you are the folks that are present, not necessarily our, our Seacoast uh, companions. And so we want to talk about that during our meeting. With that, we're at the top of the hour. And again, Peter, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Thank you who joined us this evening. And uh, remotely, I will thank those who will watch this asynchronously in the weeks to come. Yep. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening.